Now for those of you on my course, I said in my last post on Facebook that I was going to skip lectures 7 and 8. This clearly caused a bit of controversy for some of you. Um, but for the moment, I'm going to carry on doing what I think would be good. But don't worry, I will be doing lectures 7 and 8 at some point. Maybe later on during the Christmas holidays or something. Hopefully I'll have bags of time then, so on one day where I'm not doing anything, I don't know, like the 25th of December, I'll be able to do the video and then you'll all be happy. Now in the past four videos, we've been talking about E. coli a lot and how we can insert um, genes into the genome of E. coli. But what's that all in aid of? Now, I'm going to be talking about how to make transgenic plants, animals and fungi in a later video. But today we're going to be talking about how we actually express the genes that we've inserted in E. coli itself. Now this isn't just a load of fun and games, this actually does have some uses. There's a reason why we do it. For example, some of you may be uh, dependent on insulin for your survival. Well, you can thank E. coli for that or you can thank the scientists which inserted the gene for insulin into E. coli for that because then we can make E. coli express into them, we can extract all that and then um, inject it into diabetics so they can all live happily ever after and live another day. Well, hey! We've also taught loads about vectors. Now, if we want to express a gene in E. coli, there are two types of vector which we can use. Now when I say types of vector, I don't mean lambda, plasmid, cosmids, blah blah blah. We can use all of them, but I mean within those types of vectors, there are two distinct types. These are transcriptional fusion vectors and translational fusion vectors. Now on the board, we have exactly what I mean. So here is our vector that's in white here. And the thing that's shaded in is your insert. So let's say insulin for the purpose of this exercise. Now, upstream of the insert we have the promoter. That's where the that's where the transcriptional proteins bind and begin transcribing this DNA molecule into RNA. Now, the actual vector in a transcriptional fusion vector only provides the promoter. It doesn't do anything else. So that means within your insert, you've got to have two special things. You've got to have the ribosome binding site. That's the sequence of DNA which allows the resulting mRNA to bind to the ribosome and that's what allows translation to take place so you get your um, polypeptide sequence and therefore your protein. And it also contains, very important, a start codon. Now, a start codon is always ATG and that's where your sequence starts. A translational fusion vector on the other hand is a bit more helpful in this one here. Because here, it's the vector that contains the ribosome binding site and the start codon. So all your insert needs to have is the whole gene that you want to um, produce. Very useful indeed. And one of the problems with the translational fusion vector is that it's quite easy to insert your DNA in the incorrect reading frame. Later on in the video, we'll be looking at good vectors to use to ensure this correct reading frame is used. So once you've inserted your gene of interest into your vector, you can then introduce the vector into E. coli. Now if we want E. coli to actually express the gene that we've inserted, then we can't just screen the library for recombinants. We've actually got to check which colonies are expressing the gene, because you can have the um, gene incorporated, but it may not be being expressed. Now this vector that I've got up on the board here, Lambda GT11, is a great vector for forming a cDNA expression library. So far I've only been talking about inserting one gene, that's an insulin into E. coli, but of course we must remember that we could have inserted loads of genes. We could form a cDNA expression library. cDNA, as you remember, is formed from mRNA using reverse transcriptase, and we could extract all the mRNA from a particular cell at a particular time and that cDNA expression library tells what genes are being expressed from that particular cell at that particular time. Now, one of the pros for Lambda GT11 in particular is because it contains the LAC Z gene. That's also something that we've been talking about loads in recent videos. The LAC Z gene which codes for 
Beta Galactosidase. It's also useful because the LAC Z gene is very easily regulated because there's also a LAC I gene which codes for the repressor of the LAC Z gene, preventing transcription. All we need to do is to add an inducer, IPTG, or lactose, but in the lab we're usually using um, IPTG, and that will remove the repressor and then we can start transcription. So we can carry on turning this gene on and off whenever we like, which is very useful. Now let's say we're looking for the expression of one gene in particular. Well, we would need to screen our cDNA expression library, wouldn't we? Now, we're not screening for any nucleic acid in this type of screen because we've done all that before. We're actually screening for whether the actual protein which the gene is coding for is being produced. So here, our probe isn't a nucleic acid, it's an antibody. Now, for the E. to express the gene that we want when our Lambda GT11 has been inserted, um, it may not be stable enough if it was just on its own. So what we do in Lambda GT11, we use the LAC Z gene. Now if we stick our wanted gene after the coding region for beta galactosidase, then transcription will happen, it will produce beta galactosidase, and after that it will carry on going at producing our gene that we want, and then it will end in the stop codon. So you'd have your inserted gene, let's say insulin, attached to beta galactosidase. Now this really increases the stability of your mRNA and increases the chances of the gene that you want being expressed. So that's what we do. So you've done that. Now in the case of our cDNA expression library, we're looking for a particular uh, gene being expressed. Now how do we get the antibody to screen for that particular protein. Now hopefully that's already been done for us. Someone has already injected the product of this gene into some innocent pet mouse or something and extracted the antibodies that it's produced. So when we introduce the antibody to our cDNA expression library, it will stick to the plaques where that gene is being expressed. Now before we screen it, we must transfer the proteins from our plaques onto a nitrocellulose filter just how you would do with any other type of screen. Now what you do then is cover the filter with some sort of blocking solution. Now this contains proteins, not the proteins that we're looking for, and these proteins will bind non-specifically to the filter. So it will cover the filter in proteins. Well that means when we introduce our antibody, it won't bind non-specifically to the filter. These antibodies weren't designed to bind to the proteins within the blocking solution. So they'll only bind to the places where the gene that we want is being expressed and not just in random places on the filter. But this antibody has no label on it. There's no way of seeing whether it's bound at all. So that's pretty useless, isn't it? What we need, this is the primary antibody, what we need is a secondary antibody. So let's say we've injected the primary antibody, which, I don't know, we got from a mouse, and we'll insert them into your pet rabbit next, and that'll produce antibodies which bind to the primary antibody. So, you've got your protein that you want. Then you've got your primary antibody binding to it. And on top of that, you've got your secondary antibody binding to your primary antibody. And this is shown here. Now it's this secondary antibody which is labelled, usually with an enzyme like alkaline phosphatase, which when you do a simple enzyme assay, it will change colour, which will show that your gene is being expressed. Though it's a secondary antibody, bind to one antibody. So this big fork shaped thing here is the primary antibody, and all the things attaching to it are the secondary antibody. And each of these secondary antibodies has this alkaline phosphatase attached to it. We get an amplification of the signal, so it's easier for us to read um, and see whether these genes are being expressed. Now we have a problem here, because not all of the E. coli colonies which contain the gene that we're screening for are actually expressing it. Firstly, our inserted DNA must be in the correct orientation. What do we mean by that? Well, in this diagram here, 
What we have is our vector with our insert DNA um, within it. This is it in the right orientation. What's the other orientation then? Well, if you can just imagine for a moment this flipped the other way round, then that will also work. It will also fit into your vector. But it would be nonsense, because when it comes to transcribing the gene, the RNA polymerase will read it back to front. Now that won't produce any protein whatsoever. You'll just get a load of rubbish. So it's either in the correct orientation or it isn't. If it's in the correct orientation, then it could be expressed. It won't always be expressed. Why? Because it also, on top of that, needs to be in the correct reading frame. So to all the colonies which have the correct insert, they must be in the correct orientation. So that's one half, because there's two possible options, correct orientation or not. And they also must be in the right reading frame. So one out of three will be in the correct reading frame. So that means only one sixth of the colonies which have your insert will actually express the gene. So that's a really inefficient process. We need a way of sorting that out, don't we? The king amongst all vectors in this case is this guy, the PR set plasmid vector. Now it's 2.9 kilobases long and there are three different types. There's the A, the B and the C. Now, we'll come in to what they uh, mean right at the end of the video. What's important about this plasma? Well, what we've got is an origin of replication, the F1 origin of replication. F1 is a virus, so if we infect the E. coli with that virus, it will produce the DNA um, polymerase to replicate this plasmid within the cell. It's also of course the famous ampicillin resistance gene, the BLAR gene, um, so we can select for transformants. So it's a pretty regular plasmid in that sense. But it's this bit up here that we're really interested in. That's where all the exciting stuff happens. This black fragment here contains all of this stuff which I've written out at the bottom. Now, what we start off is with PT7. That's the T7 promoter. Now T7 is another virus, so in order to transcribe um, whatever we've inserted in this black region, we need to have the T7 RNA polymerase. Now E. coli doesn't naturally possess the T7 RNA polymerase, so we choose a strain which does, basically one which has been infected by the T7 virus. Now this gene for the RNA polymerase is actually located within the genome, within the chromosome of E. coli, and it's inserted in a rather convenient place. It's downstream of the LAC promoter, which is brilliant because that means we can monitor the, um, and we can control the expression of the T7 RNA polymerase. Now we've talked about 100 times now that the LAC promoter is controlled by a repressor, which when it's bound to the promoter, it will prevent transcription of the LAC gene. Now, if we insert IPTG into the medium, that will bind to the repressor freeing um, the uh, promoter from the repressor, so transcription to take, can take place. So, as transcription has taken place, it will produce the RNA, the T7 RNA polymerase, and that can then go on to uh, transcribe whatever we've inserted into the uh, polylinker here. But it's not just the polylinker and the promoter that's going on in here, we've got a whole load of stuff. So obviously we've got the uh, ribosome binding site, to allow uh, the mRNA to bind to the ribosome so the protein can be translated. We've got the ATG star codon, always very useful. Then we've got this, the six times his. Now, his stands for histidine, which is an amino acid, naturally occurring amino acid. The six means that there's six of them, okay? Now, this is special because histidine is a metal binding amino acid. Specifically, it binds to nickel. Now this is very useful in the purification of our protein because all we need to do is to get all your mixture, you insert it through a column which is layered with nickel. All the protein that we want will bind to the nickel 
and everything else will just wash through and that can be discarded. So this way we have a purified product, the protein that we want. And obviously we don't want the protein to touch that nickel forever, so what we do then is to insert a washing solution to, um, which removes the bond between the histidine and the nickel. Now you can check the purification of your protein by doing, get ready for it, the Western blot! So it's quite similar to the Northern blot and the Southern blot, but instead we're using proteins, not DNA for the Southern blot, and RNA for the Northern blot. So we're using proteins here. It's also different in the way that we're using a special type of gel for this. We're not using an agarose gel, we're using a polyacrylamide gel which is um, better when doing gel electrophoresis with proteins. We also add a substance called STS, which adds charge onto the protein, which makes them move along easier um, on the gel when an electrical current is introduced. So what we do, we load our um, proteins onto a gel, and we go gel electrophoresis, so then we probe our blot with our primary antibody, then our secondary antibody, um, do a simple enzyme assay. So once you've done that, you'll get the protein that you want moving across the gel. Now, if it's completely pure, it, only one band should appear. So that means all the protein that was in your sample is the correct one that you want. It's all been fully translated. But sometimes translation is inefficient. So you get everything at the start, so your six hits is at the start, so that's very likely to be translated into protein but not everything else after. These proteins will obviously be shorter, so will be found further along the gel because they're shorter, so they travel faster. So this way we can ensure that all the protein that we're getting is the full length. It's the real deal that we want. Now we haven't talked about what everything else means. Now after the six hits, we have the express epitope. Now that is the antigen that the antibody that we introduce will bind to. Now after the express epitope, we have this EK. What's that for? EK stands for enterokinase. Now these sequences of bases is recognised by the protein, the protease, enterokinase. Right? And what enterokinase will do is cut the DNA here. Because obviously, let's say, when you're making insulin, you don't want your six sets and you don't want your express epitope in it as well. You just want pure insulin. So your enterokinase will cut the DNA, making um, your sample of insulin even purer. Because then after that, of course, you've just got your multiple cloning sites where you've inserted your DNA and then you stop codon. So all done and dusted there. Now, what were the A, B and C for? Well, we've spoken about a thousand times that we have three different reading frames. So each A, B and C represents one reading frame. So in one of the different types of the PR set vector, your DNA will be inserted in the correct reading frame. So that way we can easily um, distinguish um, which recombinants we actually want and which ones are actually expressing the protein that we want. Hi, now one thing I forgot to mention in the actual recording, because I'm a fool, was that we've now increased our chances of um, finding recombinants which do actually express the protein. Why? Because we can isolate that type of PR set which does produce the gene in the correct reading frame. Now of course we've still got this orientation problem going on. Now we can resolve that by cutting um, the um, at the restriction sites with different restriction enzymes. That will mean that the insert DNA will only go in in one orientation because each sticky end will be different. Oh, so that's how you express genes in E. coli. How exciting. Um, I'll be back next time for hopefully some stuff on expressing proteins in more exciting things like fungi and animals. Whoa! So yeah.